John chapter 11. Uh, this is a wonderful chapter. It is. It is, a, it is a beautiful chapter, a wonderful chapter. Jesus is going to do, uh, other, than his, other than his own resurrection, um, he is going to do his greatest miracle yet. And that is to raise Lazarus from the dead in John 11. John 11 also is the location of the shortest verse in the Bible. And yet, the shortest verse in the Bible, to me, is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. Because it shows, the, it shows John 11 shows, number one, the deity of Jesus Christ and the power of that deity being able to raise someone from the dead, but also shows the humanity of Jesus Christ as he agonized and wept over his death to begin with. A death that he clearly could have healed and, and clearly could have traveled the distance to stop Lazarus from dying to begin with. And you're going to see people in the Bible question him, question Jesus, why did you not heal him when he was sick? Why did you let him die? And in all seriousness, that is a question that Anybody who's ever had to deal with death of a very close loved one, why did you have to let this person die, God? Why did you do that? Um, and some people end up angry. I know a lady that um, was part of this church when I was a young boy, uh, her and her husband, and my mom and dad became good friends. In fact, uh, her husband and my dad, they, um, several times, we went rabbit hunting together. Uh, my dad had a friend that he worked with down in St. Mary's, Missouri. And he owned, man, he owned probably a thousand acres down there. Good farmland, good hunting land. And uh, he had brush piles set up everywhere. Who, who's our rabbit hunters here? Anybody ever hunt rabbits? Just me. And um, he had brush piles set up all over the place for rabbits to hide out in. And um, so him and my dad were, were buddies there for a while. But, and he was a, he was a member of this church. Um, he had served, uh, I, I can remember at one time, I know he was uh, one of the ushers taking up the offering. I don't know if he was, um, I don't know if he was on the board at one time. He might have been. But his old sins crept back into his life. And the next thing you know, we don't see him around here anymore. His name was Mike. We don't see Mike around here anymore. And I, I wondered at that, you know, what happened? And to me, that was just, how could you do that? How could you just quit coming to church? And um, I can remember um, as a teenager, at some point, he was killed in a car accident. It was his fault. He was driving drunk, coming out of a bar one night, down on 110, and the fog was, I mean, just thick, thick fog. It was late in the night. And he slammed his car so hard against one of those little embankments there on 110. Um, his brains ended up in the back seat. That's how, tr that's how hard the impact was. And uh, he did not, he made no attempt at stopping whatsoever. He was, he was that drunk. But I can remember his wife, when I was a teenager, she uh, knew that I had surrendered to preach. 
she asked me the question, why did God take my husband away from me? I'm, and she was angry at God. She was bitter at God for doing that. Why did he do that? Why did he take my husband away from me? And so on. And in John 11, we find out that God really does have a purpose and a plan for everything that happens to us including the bad or the worst things that have ever happened to you or will happen, has yet to happen to you in the future, God has a plan for that. Okay? And that's where our trust comes in. So let's read uh, verses 1 through 4. We'll go to prayer. I've got a prayer list here. We'll cover that later. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So Jesus was familiar with this family. Uh, he knew the, the, the Mary which was a popular name, like Miriam. Miriam is the Hebrew version of it, uh, which was Miriam was Moses' sister. So, and he was, we know from Scripture that Christ was friends with Lazarus and that he loved him very much. He loved him, he was very dear to him. Um, so in verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest, is sick when jesus heard that he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of god that the son of god might be glorified thereby now let's pray and then i'll let me say what i'm going to say father uh, thank you lord for this day we thank you god for uh, again, these spring rains, we thank you, Lord, for springtime. And, and it, Lord, it just it does seem to have the effect of, of bringing new life to us. When we see more of that sunshine in the day, we thank you for it. We pray, dear God, that you would help each and every one of us who have questions in our heart, who may be, there may be somebody listening to me right now in this building, all across the internet, Lord, that is bitter, bitter with you over a tragedy that, is ha that has happened or occurred in their life, over someone very near and dear to them, someone they loved that was very close to them that has passed on. And they may be wondering, as this lady was that I talked about earlier, Father, you know who I'm referring to, that she came to me and said, why, why did God take my husband? I didn't have an answer, Father, but I knew that you did. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would supply answers to us. In some cases, we may not understand even then the answer but, Father, that you would also supply grace to go with it. Because, Father, we don't want to be angry with you forever. We don't want to be bitter and have our heart turned against you. You're our God. You're our Savior. You're the one that's going to keep us from spending eternity in the lake of fire. God, I don't want to make an enemy out of you in my life. I don't understand, Father, why certain things have befallen me or befallen people in this church or have, has happened to this church or people online. I don't know why. But, Father, help us, Lord, and, and supply us with grace to understand the way only a God who came down here to live as a man could understand. Because you went through it. So, Father, give us light. Give us understanding as we go through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, 
Amen. He said in verse 4, um, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Now, that might throw some people. They might look at that and say, see there it says plainly that Jesus did not intend for Lazarus to die. I will never forget um, attending the funeral of a young lady who was a relative of somebody in this church years ago. Uh, I think the person still goes to church here. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a teenage girl. In fact, she was just barely 13. She died in her sleep. She went to bed, a, a healthy young lady, and died in her sleep. The cause of death was listed as unknown natural causes. She just died. Now, during her life, she had gone to th three different churches. One was, uh, I think it was a Lutheran church, years and years gone by. The other one was a, a charismatic church. And I remember the other one, her other pastor was uh, Brother Jim Waymeyer. And um, they um, had, I think the family wanted me to sing something is why I was there. And so we, it was at Vineyard's Funeral Home, and I was back with um, uh, Sister, I can't remember her first name, Huey was her last name. She was my piano teacher, and she plays the organ over at Vineyard, and I've known her all my life, and I just hug her neck, and I love her to death. And uh, so I, I was singing, she was playing the piano back there, and, and I stayed in the back room with her during the funeral. And I listened to these, all three of these men give up and give a little sermon. And out of the three, I can tell you, Brother Waymar nailed it. He, he preached the gospel to that family and to all of those young people that were there at that funeral home. Uh, I was expecting something liberal out of the Lutheran guy's mouth, and that's exactly what I got. But then when the charismatic preacher got up, he made this ridiculous statement that, oh, this is such a tragedy. God lost a great victory on the day this poor young lady died, and the devil won a great victory on that day. And I'm wanting to just jump through this little veiled window and jump out and deck that guy. How dare you say that to a grieving congregation that God could not prevent the death of this 13-year-old girl. Boy, I was angry. And, I, and I'm glad that Brother Waymar got the last message in because he held an invitation. He held a hand-raising invitation. He said, everybody bow your head and close your eyes. And if you'd like to ask Jesus in your heart right now, would you raise your hand and I will pray for you. Now, I couldn't see if anybody raised their hand, but I'm just rooting for him. Amen, amen, amen. But that made me so angry for this man. And that's part of his doctrine. That, and th this is written in Christianity in Crisis by Hank Hanegraaff. That one of the statements, I think, made by Kenneth Copeland, he asked the congregation one time, do you know who the biggest loser in the Bible is? The biggest loser in the Bible is God. God lost custody and authority over planet Earth when mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, thus giving custody and authority over to Satan. And now nothing can be done on this Earth except the devil be conquered in that situation and you give authority back over to God to where it belongs. And that is a lie. There is nothing in Scripture that backs that up. So this young lady, 13 years old, again, no disease could they find, no reason at all. She went to bed one night and died in her sleep. 13 years old. That is... 
Sister Betty, would you call her, or, or John or somebody, Sister Betty Forsyth, okay? Anyway, it might be a prayer request anyway, but let's find out what it is, all right? Anyway, um, so that's, we're going to answer that question in this chapter here. In, in why does God allow people to die? Why does God allow sickness and suffering into the world to people supposedly have done nothing wrong? Doesn't God love everybody? And we are introduced to Lazarus in the first four verses of this chapter as, Lord, behold, whom thou lovest is sick. And they don't even have to give him by name to Jesus. It's already known who it is. Jesus knows exactly who they're talking about. They're talking about Lazarus. So now in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when we say Jesus, we are saying God because Jesus is God. God loved Martha. God loved Miriam or Mary. And God loved Lazarus. And people still, if God loved them, why didn't God do this for them? Why didn't God heal him? Why did God allow him to die? Why did God allow uh, Mary and Martha to endure so much pain and suffering? Why did all of that happen? And he said it back here. The sickness is not unto death. In other words, the purpose of this is not so I can kill Lazarus. The purpose of this is to show you the glory of God in its most powerful manifestation. I mean, he did it in the Old Testament, didn't he? Why did, why did God say both in the Old Testament and Paul said it in the New Testament, why did God raise up Pharaoh to begin with? Why did God put Israel and all of their people under the evil, wicked rule of Pharaoh who made them all slaves and, and made them serve under bitter, hard bondage, wishing for the day that they would die to be relieved of the bondage that they're in? Why would God uh, do that? Why would God then, after having the Israelites set free, why would God then harden Pharaoh's heart to have him go back after the Israelites and say, what, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I've set them free. What was I thinking? I'm going to go and kill every single one of them. And God is the one, the Bible says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart to cause him to do that. God drugged Pharaoh over there and forced them up against the Red Sea. For what was the purpose of that? To show Israel that God is so powerful, he can divide an entire sea and they walk across on dry ground looking into the water and seeing fish going. Looking at the Israelites going by. And then killing Pharaoh with that same thing. That's why God does that. Amen. So verse 6. When he heard therefore that he was sick, he didn't say, oh my goodness, <gasps> how bad is it? Is he going to die? Oh no, this is terrible. G guys, hurry. We don't have much time. We need, we need to get to where Lazarus is. We, we've got to run. Hurry before he dies. Uh, uh, start doing chest compressions. I'll be there shortly. He doesn't do any of that. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And I'm sure his disciples are going, Lord, shouldn't we go and see Lazarus? Verse 7, then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, 
the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? We just got through John 10, and that's what they were referring to. In John chapter 10, um, the Jews literally picked up, they picked up stones and was ready to stone him for blasphemy, making himself equal with God, saying that he was God, saying that he was the son of God. And Jesus let them have it with scripture. I have said you're gods and all of you children are the most high. So he said, if, if the word says that you're gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, then how is it that you can think that there is no chance that nobody can be the son of God? And so he proves them wrong there. They didn't stone him there. But Jesus now is ready to go back to the same place where they were going to stone him. And now his disciples are, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading into this. They say unto him, verse 8, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. Are they thinking of Jesus and hoping that he doesn't get stoned, or are they thinking of themselves, hoping they don't get stoned when they stone Jesus? I, I don't know. But they're afraid to go back. And so now in verse 9, and I, I love this because this part of the text to me has absolutely nothing to do with this story, but it's there. Jesus answered in verse 9, John eleven nine, 9, are there not 12 hours in the day? What does that mean in relation? We just told you that you're going to, if you go back there, they could stone you. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? And they're going. Well, let me back up and rephrase that. Jesus, don't you know they're going to stone you when you go there? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Now, I think part of this is Jesus is about to show who the light of the world is. Jesus is about to be glorified here on earth in a way that has not been done before. He is going to be glorified and people are going to, their jaw is going to drop. And word is going to spread of him all over Jewry, all amongst the Jews of the man who not only can heal the sick and lame, but can raise a man from the dead. Now he mentions, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, where uh, sister, sister Mama Michael is from, it is very near the equator. And every day is 12 hours. It gets monotonous. 12 hours. Now, I, I, I will vote, if I'm given a choice, I will vote to do away with changing the clocks twice a year. Amen? I would vote to do away with that. What do we need it for? Okay? But our, the day and night where we live changes because of the fact that the sun, and I've taught this a hundred times, the sun not only rises in the east and goes down in the west every day, but it also rises from the south up to the north and goes down again back to the south every year. This is where we get our weather. This is where we get our snow. This is where we get our hot days. This is where we get the differences in our seasons. And those who live in the tropics don't really see seasonal differences like we do, but we see them and we experience them. We are coming, the days are getting longer now, are they not? They're getting longer and they will continue to do that until June 21st. And June 21st will be the longest daylight of the year. And then after June 21st, it all starts shortening again until December 21st when you have the shortest 
amount of daylight in the year, okay? And I could talk about that all the time. In fact, I, I taught on this one time, and I got in trouble by people saying, he's teaching occult uh, astrology. Well, I'm going, no, wait, wait a minute. Who is it that put the sun, the moon, and the stars where they are and put them in their course and caused them to do what they do? Was that the devil? No. That was Jesus Christ. He's the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. Because he rises not only in the east and goes down in the rest in the west, but he rises also from the south to the north and then goes back down again. And it's a beauty. What you do is you make a cross with that. He literally is the sun to all four corners, which is why in the North Pole you have six months of daylight, six months of dark. Antarctica, same thing, six months of daylight, six months of dark. Okay? They only have one day down there. But anyway, he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, I've got an, an, another possible idea on this. It has to do with this number 12. So think about it. You look outside now, and it's dark. Okay? Uh, Kenya is about eight to nine hours ahead of us. So it's what, about four or five o'clock in the morning there. So in, in about two hours in Kenya, Nairobi, where Michael is, it will be daylight. In about two and a half hours, give or take, somewhere around in there, it's going to be daylight in, in Nairobi. Meanwhile, it's dark here. So now think of this. 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. It's just like the ribs. You have 12 on one side, 12 on the other. And when I started asking God, we have 12 apostles in the New Testament, 12 tribes in the Old Testament. Okay, God, who's who? Who's on the right side? Who's on the left side? If you were to ask the question to God, Who's in the light right now and who's in darkness right now? Clearly the Gentiles are walking in the light right now because of the word of God. Uh, by the way, I want you to pray for me. Um, Brother Reg Kelly has invited me down. He's having a, a big camp meeting. Their church built an outdoor tabernacle. I like that. I like those kind of meetings. Saw, and, and they literally have sawdust. They put sawdust on the ground out there for, for the floor. And he's going to run an ad, a big ad, in the local area paper around Mountain Grove, inviting pastors, telling them there's going to be free dinner. Well, that'll get them. Um, but they're also going to hear um, my testimony on the King James Bible. Why I believe it's pure, why I believe it's preserved, why I believe it's perfect. So I want you to pray for me because I'm going to be preaching to preachers. And I don't want to go down there and act like I'm a know-it-all and act like I'm a smart aleck and act like that they're all stupid and everything like that because at one time I was on their side on this. So ask God to make me meek and humble when I go down there and do this. This will be May 31st, I think is when that's scheduled. Anyway, right now, us Gentiles are in the light. Are there not 12 hours in the day? And we are children of the day. We have the light of God shining on us, and we walk not in darkness. We can see plainly where we're going. And if you ever, ever, ever have any questions about what's going on in your life, you know you can go to the Word of God and prayer, and God will give you light. He will give you answers. But right now, Israel and their 12 tribes are in darkness. They're on the other side of the world. But as the sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. As the world turns. Thank you. So what's God going to do? He's going to plunge the Gentile world back into darkness the heathen are going to bring in the Antichrist. The Jews then are going to be in the light. 
Remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time? His face shone as the sun. The sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings for Israel in that day. So take this now. And I want you to see Lazarus as being Israel, the Jews. Okay? Now, Lazarus can be a lot of people. Lazarus can be you when you were dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. Okay? But I believe also there is a, a picture of Israel's salvation in this story. So he says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not. And, but Israel stumbles. They have a stumbling block. And, and what's the stumbling block for Israel? Or sh I, let me ask, who is the stumbling block? It's Jesus. He's the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He's the stone that the builders have rejected. And he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to all the house of Israel. They hate Jesus. They hate the Christian religion. They hate they hate all of everything about it. They hate it. And they stumble now over the stumbling block of Christ. But one of these days when the light comes on to them, they will no longer stumble because they will be able to see their Messiah. If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, which is Israel or anybody that's lost, he stumbleth. Because there is no light in him. Um, to me, one of the scariest places for me personally to be is deep in the woods at night with no light. Because you can't see scratch out there. And you hear every noise there is to hear. And you just know that either a bear, a Sasquatch, or the booger man is going to get you. Momo the monster is going to come and get you. Okay? So to, me, so to me, being in darkness, is a, especially in the woods, is a... I, I don't do it. I don't like it. Okay, so I got me a, you ought to see this thing, 13,000 lumen flashlight. I can make frogs stop singing with that light. I did it the other night. Anyway, I got to move on. So now watch this, verse 11, John 11, 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, O friend, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Now, what does sleep mean in the Bible? Death. Thank you, Jaden. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, remember who Israel is or who Lazarus is. He's Israel. He's your lost friends. He's your lost family members. He's your Roman Catholic friends, your Roman Catholic family, your Mormon family members, your drug addict family members. He is, that's who Lazarus is. Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him up. Do you remember the day God woke you up? He had to knock you around a little bit, didn't he? Slap you a little bit. My, my best friend throughout my college years, and we still keep in touch. He's the only one I keep in touch with. Brother Craig Shaw. Um, he was a wrestler in high school. He was ranked fifth in the nation. He was good. He was about this tall and he was all meat. And, um, but he was deaf in one ear. And we sang together a lot. And he always had to stand on this side of me so he could hear me when we sang together. Well, he always slept on his good ear. And we shared an apartment. Our, our last year in school together, we shared an apartment. And sometimes I'd have to wake him up because he wouldn't hear the alarm clock because he was sleeping on his good ear. And this guy's got arms like this. And the first time I went to shake him and wake him up, he jumped at me. And I, just, and I thought he was going to kill me. 
So afterward, I got a stick, a long stick, and I would tap him with it like that. But we had to be awakened out of our sleep. Verse 12, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Let him rest, in other words. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Verse 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. What a strange thing for God to say. Because that's who said it. God said it. I, was, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Now, the disciples, Jesus always has a way of giving the disciples little, little fragments of what he wants them to know. He doesn't just come right out and say it. And so there's always, you can imagine, 12 guys, here's Jesus walking ahead, and the rest of them are staying deliberately, like, you know, 10 yards behind him, talking about him behind his back, going, what in the world was he talking about? Why, why is he... Why is he glad that he wasn't there? What is, are we following this guy? Really? We gave up our fishing business for this? Um, verse 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, by the way, the word Thomas and Didymus both mean twins. Thomas was a twin brother. He had a twin brother. Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now in this, it's interesting to study the characters of the, of the disciples, the, the original 12 apostles. Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, and what is he doing here? The same thing. When they came to Thomas to tell Thomas that Jesus was no longer dead, he was in fact alive, he didn't believe it. And so here, Jesus has sort of hinted that they're going to go now to Lazarus now that he's dead, and maybe, maybe Peter and James and John, maybe they caught on. Is he going to resurrect him? Boy, that we, let's go and see this. But Thomas... And he's not mentioned in too many other places, but Thomas's nature is, well, let, yeah, let's go. Let's just go and just die with him. And I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I give up way too quickly. I, I, I do. I, I've given up on things that I didn't think God could do or would do only for God to show me how foolish I was in giving up too quickly. That's, that's me in some cases. Let us also go that we may die with him. So verse 17. We'll read this and we'll stop. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave. How many days? So now we got a number to deal with. Okay, does the Bible have to give you that information? No, but it does. So why does it? So let's take a few minutes. and we, we, You've heard me mention the number four many times. Number one, it represents the gospel. And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, what is the gospel? The gospel is all about Christ, his coming to this earth as born of a virgin, his death on the cross, sacrificial, substitutional atonement for man's sins on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. And, and Jesus even made that plain to the thief on the cross in what Paul was saying. Paul was saying in Romans 10, 9 and 10, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So here's the thief on the cross. Um, Lord, 
First thing out of his mouth is Lord. He was already confessing that Jesus was Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's looking at Jesus, and Jesus is just hours away from death, and he knows it, but he also believes that Jesus is going to have a kingdom even after he dies. So he believes the whole package right away, even if he doesn't understand all the theology. He called Jesus Lord, and he called upon him to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And what did Jesus say? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Okay? So, um, let's see, where was it going with that? That was really good. That's, so the number four represents the gospel. And we know now that Lazarus is going to be brought from death to life. Again, resurrected from the dead. That's the ultimate goal of the gospel. is giving us a new life, a new start, a second chance. I preached here a few weeks ago. God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and so on. I am assuming now that Lazarus eventually died again. Or, well, I don't know, maybe he was caught up with Jesus. I don't know. But are we going to see Lazarus in heaven? Yes. Absolutely. So we have that four days. Also, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. So let's think about it for a minute. How long was it from Adam to Christ? Four thousand years, or four days. When was the first sin committed? Four thousand years before Christ came, by a man by the name of Adam, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so, four days later, or four thousand years later, Christ comes and he conquers death by his death on the cross okay you can measure it from abraham abraham lived two thousand years before christ and so two thousand years from abraham to christ that's two thousand years and then from christ first coming to christ second coming another two thousand years how many years you got four thousand years thanks bub he's listening it's Believe it or not, it is why I've never liked having a children's church. This is children's church. You'd be amazed at what they'll listen to and understand. Amen. But it's, it'll, let's say from Abraham to Christ's second coming and Israel's final redemption will be four days. And Israel is dead in their trespasses and sins. Amen. And it, I, I just, I will tell this story and then we'll go to prayer. I have helped my brother-in-law pick up bodies before, dead bodies. Uh, at one time he had the contract in Jefferson County for being the, the county coroner. The coroner is not the medical examiner. He's just the guy that when there's a deadly accident on the highway, he goes and picks the body up um, he got a call one time while we were having a fourth of July party something like that and he said you want to go with me and I said yeah because he knew I could do it and he said we got a guy that um, he's an old man doesn't have any family so nobody checked on him and apparently he died in his trailer house in a trailer court and people started smelling a smell coming out of the house the neighbors did so they called the sheriff's office and the sheriff sent a deputy out there to do a welfare check on the guy as soon as he got the door open i don't know if it's locked but as soon as the deputy got the door open he could tell this guy's dead and um i asked robert when we got there how long do you think this guy's been here he's, he's probably about four days and I, had to, I got to do the easy stuff. We suited up. 
and masks and everything and gloves. And Robert said, you just stay here and I'll get him in the body bag. And I hear Robert saying, well, I'm glad he's got clothes on. I didn't know what he meant by that, so I said, why? He said, because he's already starting to pull apart. So there's more than one reason why Jesus waited those four days. There's no disputing now about Lazarus being dead. At four days, the skin, I could see the guy just, I glanced at him a little bit. He had already, his skin had already blackened. The stench was unbearable. It took, you know, it gets in the hairs and you know, it, it took days for me to get that out of my nose. I've never seen anything like it. But I always like to use that illustration because Lazarus was very dead. There was no mistaking it. And you have to ask the question, did Lazarus save himself in any way, shape, or form? No, he can't. Because he can do nothing for his own salvation. It takes a savior to bring a man back to life. Somebody say amen. You had nothing. You had no power over your resurrection. You had no work in your resurrection. That was all done by Jesus Christ. Amen?